I find the book of the Revelation a book of mystery, a book of majesty, and a book of misery. Because it shows me the final stage of lost men, that forever and ever they're going to be cut off from God. That if there are a million roads into hell, there's not one road out. That if they continually sing in heaven, worthy is the Lamb, in hell, the only thing they sing is the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. Revelation 20, and read from verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake, lake of, of fire. fire. The judgment of the sinners. I saw a great white throne, typical obviously of purity, and him that sat upon it. Now, now we read these things and they kind of slide over our minds, but listen to the awesomeness of this. From whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And you can tell God you're not concerned about what this preacher says, but say, Lord, give me some new illumination on this awesome fact of judgment. We live too much in time, we're too earthbound. We see as other men see, we think as other men think. We invest our time as the world invests it, we invest our money. We're supposed to be a different breed of people. She's gagged and bound. She needs release in this awful hour in which we're living. And the only one that can bring that release is Jesus Christ himself. Why, even the disciples, well, well what do you think of our master now? He, <laughs> he, he's even raising the dead. And Jesus says in, in John 5, 28, listen, don't marvel at this. Oh, if this stirs you away, I've got a word for you. He says, the day is coming in the which all who are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they shall rise. Did you get that? From Adam, wherever he is right now, in the, in the sands, in the dust, all who are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God. You see, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and I believe he did rise from the dead. Not because of that long list in, in 1 Corinthians 15, but away at the end of the book of Revelation, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. Don't you believe that old bachelor in Rome? <clears throat> you don't know who he is? Well, it's the Pope. <clears throat> he says he has the keys, not on your life. Jesus has the keys of death and of hell. And at the voice of the Son of God, won't that be amazing when he says, Rise! All that are in the sea and all that are in the grave. I crossed the Atlantic, I guess, about 18 times on the Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, United States. And, and after dinner at night, when people went to smoke and drink and dance and everything else, I walked up and down the deck and almost every time I crossed it, I looked overboard and I said, Hey, you down there, you're going to get up one day. You buccaneers who died in the Spanish main, uh, stealing treasures, and the folk that sank in the Lusitania, and the people that sank in the Titanic, and, and the people that sank in all the great ships during the war, are the voice of the Son of God, they're going to rise. Millions of them, billions of them, trillions of them. And they're all going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to be a spectacle. Oh, where is it going to take place? I don't know. 
You see, this, this book of the Revelation is not only at the end of the Bible, but it deals with the end of time, and then it deals with things that happen at the end of the time. And it's the only book in the world which is authentic. And everyone that is dead is going to hear the voice of the Son of God. Look for a minute at that sixth chapter in the Revelation. Look at verse 12. <clears throat> And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig casteth her untimely a tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed in a scroll, as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, they hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day is come. In the end of the book of the Revelation, it says of the redeemed, which is in the other judgment, that they're going to come, and, and they long to see his face. Again, Fanny Crosby, blind for 84 years. And when somebody said to her, it's a shame, a great Christian like you is, is blind. You can't see the sunset. You can't see the lovely flowers. You're at such a disadvantage. Oh, no, she said, I'm at a great advantage. You know, she's a, she was a, the first woman in history, in American history, blind though she was, to address the, the, the joint, uh, what do you call them, different sections of Congress, she, she addressed the senators and she addressed the congressmen and she addressed the whole government, the first woman in history, a little blind woman. And they said, and, 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 and you never see the sunset. God has denied you so much. She said, my dear, I have a great advantage over you. What's your advantage? <laughs> she said, don't you realize the first face I ever see will be his face? Do you wonder she wrote so many hymns about his face, seeing his face? That will, that will leave us spellbound when we see his face. But here the great men, the rich men, the mighty men, the rulers. I saw the dead, small and great. Every king, every king that's ruled over England, the caliphs of Baghdad, the Maharajas of India. Stand one day, can you imagine it? At the judgment seat of Christ, to give an account for the deeds done in the body. Well, of course, if you have a judgment, you must have a judge. I do not have any pictures of Christ in my home because I don't think you should make any gra likeness of any graven image and nobody knows uh, uh, what Christ was like. You see pictures of Jesus as a baby, you see him as a young man, you see him sometimes on the back of a, uh, an animal riding into Jerusalem. But there's a picture I've only ever seen once and it was so grotesque I didn't look a second time. At the voice of the Son of God, they're all going to rise and face the eternal judge. What will he be like? In Australia, they show me the picture that they have. Uh, Beach, Beechcroft or somebody, Beecher, uh, painted the picture of Christ in Australia. He's got lovely blonde hair and bright blue eyes and a, and a lovely flaxen beard. Well, I don't think that was a picture of Jesus. And the Chinese have an interpretation of Christ through their artists. And, and there are some dreadful pictures, I think, that are being given by the great masters, so-called. And, and they've given us pictures of Jesus. But I'll tell you what, it's a very different picture in the Word of God. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ needs a new revelation of the majesty of God. This is what? This is the King of Kings. And he's the judge of judges. And it's the tribunal of tribunals. And there's no court of appeal after it. The verdict is final. There'll be no biased judgment. Two people at least have said to me this week, there is no justice in the earth today. Maybe there isn't. But I hang on to a word that says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The Apostle Paul got a picture of Jesus, not with a lamb in his arms, not like the stained glass windows in our, in our so-called cathedrals, where Jesus looks pathetically feminine. He sees Jesus and he says, here he is, he's the king immortal, invisible, the only wise God to whom be praise and glory forever. So we're going to see the king of kings, he's the judge of judges in the courts of, court of courts. 
In, in the final tribunal, there is no tribunal after this. This is finished. And when I hear people singing, you know, put your hand in the hand of him that walks on the water, forget it. For the new son that's now, shake hands with Jesus. Listen, when you see Jesus, you're not going up and say, hey buddy, I'm glad you died for me. When you see Jesus, you'll be almost paralyzed with fear unless you had a glorified body and a glorified mind. Who is writing the book? This is a revelation to a man on an island, on a devil's island. The worst place, the gathering of the scum of the earth. And here he is. And if you'd gone to him that morning and seen him sitting on a rock contemplating, you might have said to him, well, John, I didn't expect to find you in this hellhole with all these demon-possessed men. And here you are in the Isle of Patmos. He said, no, I'm not. Where are you? He says, I'm in the spirit. He was in the spirit when this enormous revelation was given to him. The picture of Jesus here is not the picture of a pathetic individual pushed around by anybody who wants to push him around. I think sometimes we think we're going to march up and say, well, you know, Jesus, do you know how many years I served you and how many souls I won for you and how many sermons I preached for you? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, what will he be like in heaven? Well, I'll tell you what the book says he'll be like. It says his hair is as white as snow. His feet are like burnished brass. His face is like the sun in its strength. His eyes are living coals of fire. His tongue is a sharp two-edged sword. And here is John, who used to lean his head on the bosom of Jesus and hear that divine heartbeat. The man that I believe knew more about Jesus than anyone else. And when he saw Jesus there on his throne in his majesty, with his face brighter than the sun, with his feet like burnished brass, with his eyes like flames of fire, with his tongue majestic and, like, and his voice like the sound of many waters, John, the man who had walked with him and talked with him for three years, says that when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. What do you think you and I are going to do? We see there the judge in all his awesome majesty, in all his glory. <clears throat> and we have a picture here of the unholy dead, small and great, standing before God. And when they see him in his awesome majesty, no, they don't worship him. They're terrified. This is a great exposure. They couldn't find the 18 minutes on the tapes of Mr. Nixon. Well, I'll tell you, he's got a perfect record of them. <laughs> and they're going to be read out one day before millions. You say, Mr. Raymond, I couldn't stand up there or anywhere else. I'm so nervous. If a few people look at me, I want to tell you something, there'll be a thousand million or trillion people when you stand there at the judgment seat without your wife to lean on or your husband or your preacher or a friend and it's, it, Paul is writing in the 14th chapter of Romans and he says we, so he writes of even to believers at the judgment seat, we must all, there's no exception, we must stand at the judgment seat of Christ, you can't send your lawyer, you can't send a representative. You can't send a, send a preacher who says, well, I understand this, uh, this person who's always falling up and down and in and out and he didn't know where they were. I, I, I'll explain it to you. And the Lord says, you won't do anything of the kind. Can you see those millions of unholy dead? All the criminals that ever lived, every prostitute that ever went on the, on, on the tour? Can you, can you think of all the men who make millions out of pornography? Can you think of the pimps who pollute those little girls that go to West 44th, West 42nd Street in New York and they go to all the hell holes? Can you imagine when God takes hold of history and empties it? When every man that ever walked the streets of ancient Babylon with all its lust? Or Corinth which was just one colossal cesspool of impurity? All that happened at last day, just last night is going to be thrown on the screen in eternity? Every judge that sits in the high court is going to be judged one day by an infallible judge. How long will it take? I don't know. And I don't care because we're not going anywhere. Yes, Mr. Kissinger, you're going to be totally exposed. What you and Mr. Nixon did lying so long that we were not bombing Cambodia when we were ripping children to death. When we were baptizing them with fire and napalm and taking the skins off their bodies. I'd like to preach a series of sermons on this because, you know, uh, the, the Word of God says there's going to be a judgment of living nations too. 
There are at least seven judgments coming up, just as there are at least five crowns for the believers. You say, I, well, I, I'm not quite sure about this, you know, my, my, my no, your memory isn't faulty. Everything you've done, every idle word you've spoken, every action. Let me say it here in case I forget later. I remember one day when I was talking with Dr. Tozer, as we used to talk together so often, he said to me one day, you know, Len, I, I'm not really too worried about what I've done. I'm not too worried about the, the judgment even on my Christian life, which I'll have, I know. But he says, he said, it's the, it's the things I could have done that worry me. The things that I missed. We're not going to be judged just because of what we've done. We're going to be judged for why we did it. Not for the action, for the motive. What motivated your giving? So you, you'd have a plaque with your name on? Or you'd be the top of the list for giving money? Why, why, why? What's the motive behind it? Going back to the unholy dead, they're going to stand small and great before God. Sometimes I look at my Encyclopedia Britannica and I think all that history is going to pass before me in flesh and blood. At the judgment seat of Christ. I'd be interested to see Julius Caesar and Tiberius Caesar. I'd be fascinated when Pontius Pilate stands before Jesus. I think he'll feel less comfortable than Jesus felt standing before Pontius Pilate. They're all going to stand there. The secret archives of our hearts and lives are going to pass before. Well, you say again, I, uh, uh, I still hang on to the fact my memory isn't good. You know, it says the books are open. I don't know what the books are. I think the books of the Ten Commandments for one thing. I think the book of memory for another thing. You, you, you see, this memory is an, an amazing thing. But you know, memory will last into eternity. Oh, I don't think the redeemed will remember their sorrows and heartaches, but I'll tell you what, the unholy dead will remember every time somebody put a tract in their hand. They'll feel it through eternity and wish to God it was there. They remember that they heard their mother's prayers. They remember every sermon. They're going to remember everything. Because one day a man in hell prayed. It was the wrong place to pray. He prayed to the wrong person. He prayed to Abraham. He got the wrong answer. <clears throat> Son, remember in thy lifetime that you had good things. But I don't want my brothers to come here. But Jesus says, remember. Memory is eternal. It will never die. If you're an unsaved man a thousand million years, you say, well, I came this morning, my wife wanted me to come, but I don't think I'll come again. I don't like this kind of stuff. Well, friend, let me tell you lovingly, go to hell and live with all the scum of the earth. You like to drink, go with the drinkers. You like to lust, go with the prostitutes. In hell, if you're given to lust after women, you'll have that lust, but there's nothing to satisfy your lust. If you drink, you'll thirst, but there'll be nothing to satisfy you. You'll give a king's ransom for one drop of water. There isn't even a drop of water. Never mind that precious wine you drink. When in God's name is the church going to open uh, her heart again and open her mind again and see again that every man, I cannot, whether he flies his own private Learjet or how many millions he has or rules over a city, the great of the earth and the scum of the earth, the, the, the unbelievers, they're going to spend their time etern in, in eternity. They're going to live there forever and ever. The good book says, where their worm dieth not. It will be awesome when we see the founders of these cults stand before God. The founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, as they call themselves, Russell, a man who wasn't very moral. And he's going to stand there and people up there will scream, put him into the lowest hell and turn the temperature up. But listen, don't you worry about it. The judge of all the earth will do right. Hell won't be the same for everybody. Some will be beaten with a few stripes, some with many stripes. But I'll tell you what, I'd rather be the least in the kingdom of God than be the greatest in the kingdom of the devil anyhow, both in time and in eternity. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. We read in the sixth chapter there of the book of the Revelation. They said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. 
For the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? It says in the ninth chapter, verse 6, In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. They shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. I believe there'll be a day when a man will put a gun to his head and blow his brains out and to his amazement he'll still be living. He'll throw himself from the top of the Empire State Building or the top of a rock into the valley, he'll still be living. They shall seek death, but they shall not find it. There's an awesome aspect for you. Men seeking death and they shall not find it. Do you remember that second psalm where it says, Concerning men that God, he that dwelleth in the heavens shall laugh, God shall have them in derision. Can you think a man played with every sin he's ever committed, sins of the flesh and sins of the spirit, sins against God, sins against men, and they pursue him like the hounds of hell that are baying after him, and he says, if only I could die and get out of this, and yet if he tries to die, he will not die. And the scripture says, he that dwelleth the holy God, now he ceased to be a God of mercy. In the fourth chapter of Revelation, you have a, 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 a Christ on the throne. You have a rainbow over the throne, which is a, a covenant sign of mercy. You have four and twenty elders, but there's nobody here sharing justice with Jesus. He sits supreme on the throne. There's no four and twenty elders. There's no sea of glass. There's no rainbow of mercy. Mercy is gone forever. I care not how twisted and corrupt your life is this morning. You could be the most sensuous man. A soldier said to me one day, do you, do, you, do you really believe that God forgive, can God forgive every sin I've ever committed? I said, he sure can. That is, if you repent of your sin and you plead for the blood of Christ and you ask for mercy. But he says, you know what I'm haunted with? I was in the army so many years in other countries. And he said, I, 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 I'm horrified to tell you this. But he said, maybe I've got about 30 children around the world. I, I've had sex with so many women, he said, that maybe I'm the father of 30 children around the world. Can God forgive all the rottenness, the corruption of my life? He can. Why? Because this morning Jesus is on a throne of mercy. He shall find grace to help. But when we see him here, he's not on a throne of mercy. He's on a throne of justice. That tender Christ who went about doing good and he kissed little babies and blessed people. Now, ah, there's no th nothing more beautiful than a little lamb. There's nothing more terrible than the wrath of the lamb. And one day God's mercy is going to be cut off. <coughs> and then it will be the wrath of the lamb. Can you think of all the tribes and nations... Can you think of Pharaoh standing before Jesus Christ and having to account for the massacre? Can you think of Herod the Great having to account for the massacre? Can you think of Hitler having to account for the massacre of, uh, we're told, of six million Jews? Did you this morning, I mean, I know you had your tribulation, the bacon was burned and some other tragedy happened. But, but did you think this morning that somebody for Christ's sake is going to lose his head in Cambodia or Vietnam? Or Russia? Do you think that Stalin ever dreamed that all the bloody purges he made, he'd have to answer for every precious drop of blood he ever spilled? The psalmist David says, store my tears in thy bottle. I believe that nobody ever spilled a tear, whether it was spilled in, in compassion for souls, or it was, it was spilled because of a broken heart. It never fell to the ground, it was stored by God, and God's going to count them out one day. And people may cry, the Jews perhaps may cry, uh, of Hitler, uh, God scourge him, scourge him, turn the, the furnace up in hell. But listen, God doesn't need any reminders. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? If a man has to be cast away from God with his own sin and misery forever and ever, if, if his inner being, as it were, is, is torn with lust, if his mind is tortured by his wickedness, well, what do you think it would be like if you killed six million people like that? God should bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. And I think we'd better watch this business of, you know, God loves you, God loves you, and all the bumper sticker sloppy evangelism. Will you remind people of the goodness and the severity of God? Will you remind them that there's a day when mercy is cut off forever? Will you remind them that people pray in hell but nobody ever answers? 
The dead, small and great, are going to stand before God in that awesome day. And the book of memory is going to be open, and the Ten Commandments and, and, and other books that God has are going to be open in that awesome day. And there's no mercy. Mercy has gone forever. People will be saying, the harvest is past and the summer is ended and I'm not saved. That great scholar Daniel Webster was once asked, what is the greatest thought? You have a colossal mind. What is the greatest thought that has ever travelled down the corridors of your mind? He said, I've thought many great things, but the greatest thing that I've ever thought of, the most awesome, the most terrifying, the most shattering thought I've ever had is my personal accountability to God one day. We, we all, all without, without exception, exception.